Hey everyone, as many of you know, we are full-time RVers and we power our lives through the four solar panels that are up on the roof of our travel trailer. And we installed our solar ourselves and we've been living with it now for over three years. And through talking with a lot of people on RV solar, we know what many of the mistakes that people make when they're looking in to get solar for their own RV or when they start purchasing components. So we're going to be talking about five major mistakes mistakes that we've heard of or that we have experienced ourselves when it comes to sizing solar or installing it yourself, stuff like that. But there are not only five mistakes that can be made, there are many more mistakes and many of you watching may even be working with some of those mistakes right now or are experiencing some that you don't have an answer to. And while we may not have the answer to that mistake for you, um, if you leave questions or comments or things that you have dealt with in the past down in the comment section below, it could be an excellent resource for some people in order to find answers to some of the questions that they might be having too. The first mistake that we're going to talk about when installing RV solar is that sometimes people don't know to use fuses and or circuit breakers in the right spots in their uh, solar setup. For RV solar, it's a good rule of thumb to place a fuse on the positive wires between the battery bank and the inverter, between the converter charger and the battery bank, as well as between the solar panels and the solar charge controller. Now when it comes to what size fuse you should be using in each of those three positions, it's, it really just depends on your particular setup and it's going to be different for every setup. Uh, but what you'll want to keep in mind is that the fuse size, the amperage that it's rated for, should be just over the maximum amount of amperage that you will ever intend to send through those wires. However, that amperage rating of the fuse should also be below below the maximum amperage rating for the wire you're using because you know you don't want to trip the fuse or you don't want to blow the fuse under normal conditions you know if you're going to be sending the maximum amount of amperage that you plan on sending through that wire however at the same time you want the fuse to do its job and blow in the event of a short circuit in one of those wire runs because if the fuse is if the amperage rating of the fuse is greater than the amperage rating of the wire, then you could get into a, a condition where you know, you're sending too much amperage through the wire and it catches on fire without the fuse doing its job of blowing, say, in a short circuit condition. For example, the wire that is running between our solar panels and our solar charge controller is 10 gauge wire, which is rated for a maximum of 30 amps. And we should never under normal circumstances see more than 20 amps running through that wire. So we have placed a 20 amp blade style fuse on the positive wire between our solar panels and our solar charge controller. So it will, it should never blow under normal circumstances. However, if there is a short in the wire, uh, it will blow before the wire ever experiences its maximum amperage rating, and it should save us from having some sort of, you know, fire if there is a short circuit. But fuses aren't the only thing that you're going to want to have on your system. You also want to install circuit breakers because it's really nice to be able to just with a little switch kill power to certain parts of your solar setup if you need to do maintenance on them or really for whatever reason should you choose. So again, it's a good idea to have circuit breakers or at least some sort of like kill switch on the positive wire uh, between, again, the battery and the inverter, the charge controller and the batteries, and between the solar panels and the uh, solar charge controller. Another mistake people make is not understanding the limits of RV solar. And what I mean by that is when it comes to planning how much solar you want, how big of a battery bank you want, a lot of people end up roping in really high draw appliances with that calculation. For example, they'll want to run their air conditioner for a whole day or overnight or something like that. They'll try and want to run their residential style RV refrigerator off of it or they'll want to run their water heater off of solar. And while those are feasible to be done on a solar array, it's not practical in an RV. 
The reason it's not practical to rope hydraw appliances like that into calculating out how big of a solar array you want is because you need a really big solar array to do so. You need a lot of solar panels on your roof and maybe you don't have the space for that if you have a smaller RV. You probably need a lot of batteries in order to run, especially an air conditioner, overnight even, just for a couple of hours. You're gonna need a large battery bank and you need space for all of that. You need um, to have the weight capacity in order to have all of that. And that's going to be pretty expensive, especially if you're going with lithium iron phosphate batteries. Actually, strike that. If you're wanting to run uh, your air conditioner off of solar, you're going to need lithium iron phosphate batteries. And that alone, just how many you're going to need, you're going to be spending between $10,000 and $20,000 just on batteries. And that just isn't practical. What is practical though is running a generator. We have an inverter generator. If we ever need to run our air conditioner, we just get that out. It is way more affordable than to have a massive solar array in order to run it on the few occasions that we need it. Another good solution though is to stay at an RV park. If you're staying somewhere that's really hot and you need to run your air conditioner, stay at an RV park if you can. Or you can do what we do and we travel with the weather. Those are really cost-effective ways in order to be able to run things like those hydro appliances while not forking out all the money or needing a larger RV for all the space that you're going to need for those batteries or those solar panels as well. Another mistake that people make with RV solar is not monitoring or maintaining their batteries properly. Now when it comes to lithium batteries, uh, you really have to have a battery monitor kit uh, installed to monitor uh, every amp that goes in and out of the batteries. And the reason is because lithium batteries have an extremely flat voltage curve as they're being charged and discharged. So there's really no way of estimating a battery state of charge off of voltage. So if you want to know the state of charge of your lithium batteries, you have to have a battery monitor that does what's called Coulomb counting. And that's like I said, where it literally counts and keeps track of every amp that goes in and out of the batteries. Other than that, Lithium batteries are basically maintenance free. The only thing that you wanna be very aware of is that if you charge or discharge lithium batteries when it is below freezing, you can severely damage your lithium batteries. So um, if you're going to be in areas that have freezing temperatures, you want to heat whatever area your batteries are stored in somehow. And you know what we do is uh, we just place a small little incandescent light bulb inside of the battery bank, and that's enough to keep that insulated storage area above freezing so that our batteries can still be discharged and charged safely. When it comes to lead acid batteries though, they're a little more finicky, and not only do they need monitored, but they also need maintained. Now there are lead acid batteries that are fairly maintenance free, like AGM batteries. However, uh, wet cell batteries are the most common form of lead acid batteries. And all lead acid batteries, you need to be very aware that they have to be charged in three stages, bulk charged, absorption charged, and then float charged as you know you are charging them. And so if you really need to have a three stage um, converter charger to properly charge lead acid batteries. And then if you have wet cell lead acid batteries, you have to maintain the electrolyte level inside of those batteries. As you use them, the electrolyte level goes down and you have to refill them at regular intervals to keep from damaging wet cell lead acid batteries. And then when it comes to all battery types, you need to be aware of what discharge level will damage the batteries. When it comes to lithium batteries, you can typically discharge them very deeply, almost to 0%, but it's never a good idea to take lithium batteries that low. You usually want to leave 20% of the charge in a lithium battery uh, before you start to negatively affect the lifespan of the battery. Uh, lithium batteries can definitely handle a even deeper discharge from 20%, but they're so expensive and we want ours to last 
for a very long time. So we never discharge ours below 20%. And then when it comes to lead acid batteries, you never want to discharge them below 50%. Uh, you will severely reduce the lifespan of a lead acid battery if you discharge it regularly below 50%. Another mistake some people might make when it comes to sizing their RV solar is not fully understanding their own power consumption. If, for example, you're watching a YouTuber or anybody else that might be installing sol solar on an RV or even a house, and you think to yourself, well, I really like them, I like how much they have, That's pro that'll probably work for me, and you just buy it and you install it you're going to run into issues. And you're going to run into issues along the lines of either having way more solar than you actually need, and then you're spending all that money on it when you could have been saving that money instead, or you run into an issue where you actually have a lot more power consumption than the person you might be watching or someone else's install that you might have watched, in which case when you go out and you're actually trying to use your solar setup, then you're going to run into issues with not having enough power to do what you wanted to do. And while I would love to get into all of the details on how you yourself can size your own RV solar setup in this video, it really truly is its own video, but luckily for you guys, we made a video on this a long time ago. We're going to go ahead and post a link right here that you can click on to go straight to that video, watch it, it's very informative, or down in the video description below, there is a link to that video as well. David went into so much detail, gave you step-by-step -step information on how to not just size your solar panel array on your roof, but also your battery bank and the size of your inverter. And then the last mistake that we're gonna talk about when it comes to getting solar for an RV is using lead acid batteries, period. Uh, however, I will concede that lead acid batteries are good for if you cannot afford the large initial investment that lithium batteries take. I will admit lithium batteries are very expensive up front. However, they will last so much longer than their lead acid counterparts that they will pay them so themselves off in the end. For instance, the lithium batteries that Ro and I have, you know, we've had them for three years now and we have noticed no reduction in their charge capacity. And our lithium batteries, we expect them to last well over 10 years. Now, a lead acid battery that you're using every single day and you're cycling as much as Ro and I are, there's no way that you're gonna get anywhere near that type of life out of. And also, I suppose it is okay to use lead acid batteries if you're not gonna be using your RV very much. You know, let's say you only take it out like two, three, four times a year, and you just wanna have solar so that you don't wanna fire your generator up for whatever reason, then making that large investment into lithium might not be worth it for you in that instance. Uh, but I will say, if you're gonna use lead acid, use AGM batteries. They're maintenance free and they're much, they're just much better in almost every way than wet cell lead acid batteries. However, for those of you that are gonna use the heck out of your RV, maybe you're a full-time RVer like Ro and I and you're going to be using it every single day, I implore you to get lithium batteries. And the specific battery chemistry that we use and we love is lithium iron phosphate because there is virtually no chance of the batteries igniting in an overcharging condition or an over discharging condition. It's a very stable, very safe battery chemistry. So if you're able to save up and invest in lithium batteries, just go ahead and do it. In the long run, again, they will pay themselves off as opposed to using lead acid batteries and you will not regret using lithium because honestly, they're better than lead acid batteries in every single way. And we've actually made an entire video on this as well, the lithium versus lead acid batteries debate. And you can go ahead and check that video out too. There's a link right there, as well as a link in the video description below. We really dive into comparing the two battery chemistries and really why lithium is better than lead acid in every single way.
So those have been five common mistakes when it comes to RV solar. And David and I have gotten a lot of requests from you guys asking if he could install solar <laughs> on your rig for you. Because a lot of you really like his solar, solar install videos and you know that we're really knowledgeable about that. And while that is all fine and dandy, we're not comfortable doing that. <laughs> However, we do have a friend that is. Thomas with I'm Not Last Time RVing is doing some solar installs now. And on their website, they have a form that you can fill out in order to get a quote from him. And we'll go ahead and pop a link down in the description below for you so that you can go there and check it out. But those have been the five common mistakes that people make when getting solar for their RV. And I hope that, you know, bringing light to some of these is really helpful to you guys. And, you know, maybe we saved you from making one of these common mistakes, keeping you out of those pitfalls. But that's all for us today. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. bye. Oh, sweet pea. Hey, you say should say bye. bye. Say bye. <laughs> Oh, that was a lot of buys. <laughs>